Yes. I want you to realize that the altar has so much love and attention and intention in it. It is really a prayer that we get to see. So this altar reflects today's talk about change. And you'll notice that at the center of it is this path. And the path takes some sudden turns. But the path is overseen by the angel protecting us. It has Kuan Yin on the path, reminding us to be compassionate with each other and with others along the path. It has the Buddha reminding us to let go of attachment of what shows up in this path. It has the beautiful, beautiful evidence of spring and fresh new life. And you'll notice that in the Buddha's bowl, there's a lemon not only reminding us of a little humor, but to, uh, when we get lemons, to make lemonade. <laughs> Beautiful altar. And so now I get the privilege of introducing our speaker for today, who I think we all know, we all love. This speaker has been a minister, a worldwide speaker, a published author, a facilitator, not just here for us, but uh, literally around the world for many years. There have been many, many people, countless thousands of people that receive her personal insight, her way of humor, her way of drawing our attention to something that we need to hear in the way that is hers alone. And so I already expect, I'm raising that expectation once again, that we'll be met and exceeded by our very own Reverend Mary Murray Shelton. Thank you, Francine. That was great. Watch your glasses. Thanks, everybody. Good morning. Good morning to those of you that are watching us online this morning. I want to just say you, you missed some great music. I'm so sorry for you. Eddie, thank you. Wow. Wow. Spectacular. I, I just love it. So, let's see, where's my little clicker doodah? Okay, so. We are in the month of March, and our theme this month is Divine Expression is Our Natural Calling. So, Reverend Carol's been taking us through The Happiness Project, the book The Happiness Project, and this is our theme for March. And our goal for March is to aim higher to aim higher. So as we look at our lives and our work and our calling, we're looking at lifting our energy and our attention up a little bit higher than they have been before and letting ourselves be supported to be raised and, and to take that vision higher. My talk today is about when your calling changes. When your calling changes. You heard a little bit about um, from um, Francine about Eddie moving his focus from Motown and all those great artists. By the way, you know, when I listen to you, I know you're completely unique, but I'm hearing a little Barry White, a little, you know, um, uh, Lou Rawls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's what I'm getting. Um, so he made a shift, and I think many of us have had a, a movement through a variety of, of paths and tasks. I heard a story here. I wrote it down. Two priests went to Hawaii on a vacation. They decided they would make it a real vacation and not wear anything that would identify them as clergy. So when they landed in Hawaii, they went to a local store and they bought some really outrageous shirts and shorts and sunglasses and sandals and hats and they were ready to enjoy their incognito identity as tourists. And so the next morning they went to the beach dressed in their tourist garb and they were sitting on beach chairs enjoying a drink in the sunshine and enjoying the scenery when a pretty blonde woman in a bikini walked down the beach toward them, and they tried not to stare. But when she passed them, she turned to them and smiled, and she said, good morning, Father. Good morning, Father. And then she went on her way. And they were stunned. How in the world did she know that they were priests? And so the next day, they went back to the store, and they bought even more outrageous Hawaii gear. They said these outfits were so loud you could hear them before you saw them. And they had just settled in their chairs on the beach to enjoy the sunshine when the same pretty blonde woman in another little bikini came walking down the beach toward them, and then she approached them and greeted them individually again. Good morning, Father. Good morning, Father. 
And one of the priests couldn't stand it, and he said to her, oh, just a minute, ma'am, we're, we're both priests, it's true, but I just have to know, how in the world did you know that? And she said, oh, Father, don't you recognize me? I'm Sister Catherine. <laughs> We have been known to shift our calling, you know, <laughs> even briefly, even briefly. So now some of you who haven't been around for this whole series may be wondering, you know, what the heck is a calling anyway? What does that really mean? What is a calling? So I have a sense of it, of course, but what I did was I looked it up to find out, and in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it says, a calling is a strong inner impulse toward a particular course of action, especially when accompanied by a conviction of divine influence. That's a calling. So it's really God's invitation into relationship. And it also means sometimes to call something into being by naming it. So in essence, the infinite, you know, in the Old Testament, the names are constantly being changed. And the names are changed because somebody's gone through a transformation and now the old name doesn't fit them anymore. So in a sense, when we shift our calling, when we experience a change in our lives, we almost could take on a new name because it's like our path has shifted. I like talking about divine rewrites and cosmic left turns because I, I like talking about them more than experiencing them. <laughs> but it's true that, you, I mean, really, let's get real here. But the truth is, Life does take us sometimes in directions where we don't understand why things have shifted. And we find ourselves in the middle of them and we recognize them as ours, but we're still kind of trying to catch up with what's changed and figure out what it means and what it is. You know, I started out my life thinking I was going to be an actress. I was a drama major in college. That didn't evolve the way that I thought it would. And so I was kind of at sea. What's next? You know, what am I supposed to do? I wound up working in retail. I was a department sales manager in a big department store. And then I became a mother. There's another calling. Each time, my name should have changed. Well, my name did change. I became mama, <laughs> you know. So then I became a mother. And then I started working for a French restaurant about the time I went into the school of ministry. Calling's changing again. I worked for a wine importer and wholesaler who was so happy to introduced me to people as a divinity student when I was sitting there at 10 o'clock in the morning with a glass of wine next to my computer <laughs> because we were tasting something. You know, he thought he got a great kick out of that. And, uh, and then I became a minister. That was, the, that was the most surprising and scary one of all. Like, what does this mean? I remember being in Santa Rosa my first day as a minister, sitting at the desk thinking, what the heck am I doing? You know, I know how to be a student, so I was a minister at all these different churches. I wrote a book. I became an author. Recently, I was looking at, you know, what's the next way to be in the world? And I was having a conversation with a professional uh, facilitator who works with people as a coach. And um, I said, I'm not sure what my niche is. You know, you'd think after all these years, I'd know who I am and, you know, where to focus and all that stuff. And, and she said, well, let me help you with that. So we started talking about areas that people are interested in growing in, you know, in the world. She said, well, people are always interested in growing about their money. They're interested in growing about their relationships. They're interested in growing about health and beauty. So we talked for a while, and she said, well, yours seems like relationships, and I agreed. And she said, you know, what, what age group are you talking about? And I said, well, you know, usually people around my age, although I wouldn't mind going a little younger. And men or women? Well, women are the ones that usually come to me. You know, she said, well, let's talk about relationships. She said, do you mind telling me about your situation? You married, you divorced, you, you know. Well, uh, married, divorced, you know, married to a man, divorced, now married to a woman. I got a grown son, a grandson. They, my son's married. My, she said, oh, I know what your niche is. <laughs> she said, you need to work with women who've always been in relationships with men who are questioning their sexuality. Suddenly, a new, a completely new calling. And I'm like, whoa, okay, wow. You know, and it, I, I recognized it as something that fits, and then part of me went, how do I find these people? You know, well, that's the next question to work on, I guess. But, 
you know, I, I mean, at the beginning, you know, people were coming to me because I was like the poster child for it, but this is different now, so. <laughs> so one of the things that St. Paul said in the letter to the Ephesians is, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. To live a life worthy of the calling you've received. So even if you're in the midst of a new calling, an unfamiliar calling, or something that you recognize fits you but you haven't done it before, no matter how long you've been on the planet, the universe is taking you into a new place, another calling. You know, this little image of this little kitty cat doing a self-portrait of himself as a tiger, you see, he's seeing a new calling, a new possibility for himself. When my son was a freshman in college, and we went to freshman orientation, they said, don't be concerned when your child changes majors. Each kid that's here in school is going to change majors three to four times. So how many majors have you had? You know, a lot of us, when our parents were born, you had one career. You got a job, you were lucky to have it. That was what you did for your entire life. I don't know anybody that does this anymore. Nobody, you know? There, everybody, well, I can't, I shouldn't say everybody, but, you know, for the most part, we discover and more unfolds, and even if we stay on the same path, it goes in a different direction than we thought it was going to go. So the changes reveal the new vision. They reveal the new direction. Now we're experiencing today Palm Sunday in the Christian tradition. By the way, Passover starts on Friday, which is what Jesus was doing when he was arrested. You know, I, th I think sometimes in the Christian tradition, people forget that Jesus didn't do Easter. He was Easter, but he didn't do Easter. You know? There were no bunnies. There was no chocolate. It was, you know, it was a different thing. He was doing Passover as an observant Jew. He was doing Passover. And on Palm Sunday, look at the difference in his experience of his calling between Palm Sunday and Good Friday complete turnaround, you know? And I wonder, I wonder if he knew, really, or when he knew what his calling was and that it was changing. I wonder when he knew and what it felt like to go through the process of that calling changing. So because Eddie's here this morning and there's something about the voice in music and the, and the soul of music that can take you to a place sometimes that words alone cannot do. So, Eddie, would you come on up and uh, sing that little song? There once was a spirit that knew it was the light among the other spirits whose lights were just as bright. But the spirit longed to experience what it would be like to be the light, to be the light. Now the spirit went to God and asked, how can I really know when all there is is light and love everywhere I go? There is brightness all around me. And every spirit shines I want to go where I can show This little light of mine Rise, little spirit Rise, little spirit You'll go back to where you came from And I know that you'll do well And your mother is well pleased So as you call upon the night I will always be with you You are the light for this all to work. God caused it to forget who it was and how it came. But in its heart it left divine intuition that was sure to show the way back to the light through the darkest night to make it home someday. Rise, little spirit. Rise, little spirit. You'll come back to where you came from. I know that you'll do well And your father is well pleased So as you call upon the night I will always be with you You are the light Now the night came and the darkness fell And it was all the soul could see And it 
cried out into the darkness, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Then suddenly, everything became bright. And finally, it realized and shouted, I am the light, I am the light. Rise, little spirit, rise, little spirit, you'll go back to where you came from and know that you've done well and your mother is well pleased. So as you call upon the night, I am always with you. Know that I've always been with you Cause you are the light I said you are the light I said you are the light Yeah Thank you, Are you ready? Thank you So I wonder when it was that Jesus actually was aware of what his calling was, or as it changed, how he grew into the next bit of it. You know, did he know when he was 12 years old and he was talking to the rabbis in the temple and amazing them? Did he know when he was baptized by John what his calling was, what he was headed into? Did he know on, uh, at the marriage of Cana you know, it sounds like he didn't quite know at the marriage of Cana. This is interesting to me. It says, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, good Jewish mother, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. Like, mom, come on. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. What do you think he did? Like any good Jewish boy, he did what his mother wanted him to do. He didn't think he was ready, but he changed the water into wine that they brought. That was the directive, honey. Get with the program. So I don't think he thought it was time yet, but nevertheless, the universe moved him, divine left turn, you know, mom, you can always count on her, <laughs> moved him to the next one, you know. Did he know on Palm Sunday? when he was such a big deal and everybody was putting palms down for him to cross over and waving them and yelling Hosanna. I mean, that could swell your ego a little bit. And then to be arrested, to be executed. You know, we, we watch this whole process in the life of Jesus and then the resurrection. Now, of course, we don't know in New Thought if every one of these things literally happened. It doesn't really matter. The essence of the story is the same for all of us. We go through Passion Week, don't we? We go from triumph to falling. We walk down a path that's difficult, where we don't feel supported, where maybe we have been betrayed, where even those closest to us have run away, or gotten bored, or let us down. We go through the most difficult moments of our lives, sometimes feeling very alone. And when we come through on the other side, we're appreciative of all the support and help that we've had, and we remember who we are. And we bring that remembrance forward. So this week is kind of about remembering all of that and letting ourselves be lifted if we're down right now and letting ourselves shine if we're in a triumphant place right now so that we can reach over and help others who might not be in that place today so that they can help us tomorrow because the path continues. The path continues to wind, and we can't always see where it's going. So the process of <clears throat> moving forward is that callings emerge gradually. They don't reveal themselves whole and complete. You know, I think that if we came to a world in which there was no contrast and no comparison, and in which we lived forever, and people didn't age, nothing ever aged. You know, everything in form ages. It has a lifespan. It ages, and then it goes. And it reveals and brings forth something new. But if that wasn't the case, 
If everything reached its zenith and then just stayed there, we wouldn't change or grow. We wouldn't need to. There'd be no births because there was no death. And life would be completely static. We wouldn't make any leaps or improvements or discoveries because everything would be just fine. But we also wouldn't have great celebrations and joys because everything would be the same all the time. So we need the hills and the valleys, and we need the contrasts, and we need the aging process and the influx of new life so that we can grow and stretch and expand and experience and become. You know, we, uh, Michael Beckwith says we came here to experience and express love. And what we want to be able to do is to experience our own expression and expansion. And for that, we need contrast. For that, we need the ups and downs of the road. We need the passion, and we need the tears, and we need the celebration. We need the orgasmic experiences. Can I say that? We need all of it. Yeah? We need all of it. So um, in, in my little book of quotes here, my favorite quotes, I have this one from Rumi. When you do things from your soul, you feel a river moving in you, a joy. And he also says, let yourself be drawn by the stronger pull of that which you truly love. Let yourself be drawn by the stronger pull of that which you truly love. That's your next calling. It doesn't matter how long you've been on the planet. What moves you? Move toward it. That's your next calling. And even if it doesn't have a name or a shape, or you're not sure how it will work, in fact, that's even the best when you don't know how it will work. Because when you don't know how it will work, usually you're scared. And when you're scared, you're willing to have help and you're asking for help, and you're open to guidance, and the intuition that Eddie was just singing about that's always been planted in there, that becomes available to us. So know that your calling, whatever it is, is going to be more satisfying and more challenging and more fun than somebody else's would be for you. You know, um, Emerson makes a point in one of his essays, maybe self-reliance, he says, these roses under my window make no reference to former roses or better roses. They're just themselves, you know, and that's what we're called to be. Former people, better people, other times in our lives, it's completely irrelevant because we're one of a kind. So those comparisons that drag us down, they may spur us onward, but they're really not accurate. What we want to be able to do is to follow the path of our own unique intuition to follow the path with its twists and turns and dare to peel the next layer off the artichoke or the onion, the next layer that moves us with the artichoke into that sweet heart. You know, if we're still here on the planet, we're not done peeling those layers off the artichoke. And the important thing to remember with all of this is that your heart knows the way. Your mind may not know the way. Minds get confused, but your heart knows the way. Even if you feel that you've never seen this place that you're in before, your heart knows the way. So I'm going to encourage you to remember when you don't know, when you're not sure, when life has dumped you out in a new part of the path and you don't know from up, follow your heart. Follow the path. Your heart knows the way. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Now, the inner work for this morning is going to follow our going deeper. And going deeper is our hearts know the way, even when we think we don't. It is safe and deeply satisfying to open to our next calling. So I invite you to come into the inner work with me right now. As we close our eyes together, let's bring our attention to our hearts. See if you want to put your hands on your heart, if you can feel your own heartbeat. 
It's said that the drum is Great Spirit's favorite instrument. That's why all of us have a heart. And this heartbeat, it doesn't stop where we feel it here in our skin, but this vibration travels out through the universe as our unique presence. We are truly expressions of the one right here and now knowing that the depth in us is blessed. So we invite the inner knowing to guide and lead us today, knowing that what we need to do and be and realize and welcome and release today is enough to know. We open to it and we welcome it, knowing we are well equipped for it. The soul and the heart know this even when the mind wonders. We're well equipped for it. And so we bless the path we're on. We bless our own path. We bless all of it and everybody that's ever crossed it with us. We bless it all. And we bless the dear little spirit we are, shining our light so brightly right here, right now. And so it is. I believe you're next. What do I do? Oh, yes! Music! We have music! We have music. Come on up, Eddie. There we go. Let's welcome the amazing Eddie Watkins, Jr. <laughs> 